Welcome to Retirement Revealed. I'm your host, Jeremy Kyle, and we're here to turn your retirement savings into retirement income. Today, we're talking with Dan McDonald about how to pick a tax-wise retirement withdrawal strategy. Those words put together are probably some of my favorite words in the English language. So when I heard about Dan, I wanted to get him on the show right away. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now, we were talking uh, tax-wise retirement withdrawal strategy. We focus a lot on retirement. That's by a lot. I mean, that's all we do. Uh, but tell us about yourself. Sure. Well, I started focusing on it a little more in the last couple of years. I've been practicing law for about 37 years and was getting ready to at least put one foot out the door for retirement and uh, downshift at work from full time and have been accumulating those that money and all those retirement accounts for all those years. And uh, when the focus was, you know, save enough to retire. And then as I was getting closer to actually using that money, I realized, oh my gosh, I have no idea what to do now. And that's actually what, where the book From Savvy Saver to Smart Spender came from. Yeah, it's, uh, what I love about your story is that it's really coming from your own personal experience. And of course, I feel like we do a good job of retirement planning, but uh, I got to tell you, I have not yet retired. I haven't... Uh, face down the uh, the barrel of retirement the way that it sounds like you were and so i appreciate you taking the time to say this is a big deal this is a one-time situation what do i need to know that i haven't uh, learned before and of course what i love even better is that you're sharing it with people uh, I, I i gotta ask how is that like so you you said you're practicing law for 37 years you've got to be a smart person right you got to love studying but what was it like to face a situation you you probably didn't feel prepared for what, what was that like oh exactly that, that's it it's you know it's um you're supposed to act like you've been in the end zone before but i've never been in this particular end zone before right i mean you only get to retire once and make that transition once so um yes saving was the easy part in in retrospect you know that that wasn't too complicated you know put your money in your 401k or ira or wherever you can stow it away and save save a little more than you spend and and uh, that'll get you to the door uh, but, uh, you know, I mentioned in the book, it's kind of like being at the top of the roller coaster. The first 37 years were going up the roller coaster. Now we're at the top and it's OK, I think this is going to be different now, but I don't know how. And so, yeah, I, I, I can I can relay that to you that even if you've thought about it a lot, as I know you have and uh, thought of a lot of angles, you look at it a little differently when you're actually knocking on the door. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of that uh, roller coaster analogy before, but I really like it because uh, I think most people go through that roller coaster uh, in the fact that it's almost like they let retirement happen to them. Like everybody else did this with their Social Security. Everybody else is just waiting till require minimum distribution age. And it just kind of happens because that's what happens on a roller coaster. You don't have to do much to <laughs> go down the hill. Right. right? Uh, but you have so much control. And I think that's what you're really trying to get people to do is take the control that they have that maybe they didn't have uh, or di they didn't think that they they had. So what did you discover then that was maybe kind of new or surprising as you were doing your research? Well, one thing was just when you see a lot of the websites or whatever helping you plan, they say, well, you know, figure out how much money you're going to want to spend every year. How much have you got? When are you retiring? And, you know, if, if you are really smart, when are you going to die? Right. And then now we can tell you how much money you, have you got enough? Have you saved enough? But one one thing I noticed when I looked at these budgets is they have, you know, your housing costs, your food costs, transportation, of course, all the regular things on there. But after I looked at a couple of even the better ones, I realized they're missing something. They don't have income taxes on here as one of these budget items. And uh is that does that matter is there a reason maybe it's not going to be much money or should i take a look at this and so i kind of dug into it and said well you know if you've got a decent amount of money in your iras or 401ks the tax deferred the regular accounts that are going to be taxed when you uh, take the money out in retirement and you've got social security if you've got a pension if you're going to work a little bit yeah income taxes could be a pretty big deal they could actually be bigger than all of those other costs that are in the budget so that was kind of revelation number one and then revelation number two was, as you were just saying, Jeremy, you can actually do something about it. I mean, you, you live most of your life if you're you get a W-2, you get a paycheck. You're just trying to get as much money in that on that thing as you can every year. And then, you know, maybe you've got some deductions, you do charitable contributions, you can move the needle a little bit. But you don't really have a lot of control 
over what your income taxes are going to be necessarily during those working years. But depending on when you take the money out and how much you take out in retirement out of the IRA and 401k, it turns out those levers give you a lot more adjustments and you can actually have a big impact on that. Yeah, it's amazing too with these these budgets. Uh, what's I, I tell people I don't believe any budget that walks in my door. Uh, I possibly have a little bit of um, connection. I have a little bit of empathy for the budget that uh, somebody had from like mint.com or QuickBooks. I, I've seen those maybe maybe one out of a hundred budgets. Somebody has, this is literally all my spending down to the penny for the last two years and I've averaged it out. And I appreciate when people take that level of detail. They took that level of detail to do that. But then my first question is, how did you account for health insurance? And yeah. there's just kind of a blank. And then my next question is, how did you account for taxes? And there's yeah. kind of a blank. Because you you generally spend your paycheck and your paycheck has health insurance and taxes already taken out of it quickbooks mint.com these places don't account for your taxes because it's already uh taken out of that so it's that's interesting that you found the same thing to do that uh when they say add up your cable bill and add up your uh you know travel expenses taxes is one of the top three expenses in retirement it's your your health costs your home costs your housing costs uh, and your tax costs and all three of them kind of average out to roughly 20% is what I see each. 20% each mm -hmm. is what I see on average. But again, that's averages. Uh, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. if you've been such a good saver, you have a higher amount in these traditional type of accounts. Your tax bill could be, and just I would say oftentimes is the number one expense. So so clearly it's a big thing that you want to uh, want to plan for. Right. If it's not number one, it's going to be a close number two or number three for a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, it seems like what you did is you, you created your own uh, retirement tax simulator. And I like how you call it the retirement tax simulator because it's retirement taxes are different. Not like the income tax system is any different at all. It's just it, it hits you different. You haven't usually when you're working, you're not on Social Security. You don't have required minimum distributions. These things don't come into play. It's same system. You just haven't, uh, I guess, gotten there yet. So tell us about this uh, this tool you you put together. I imagine it's for yourself, and and now you're kind of talking more about it for for others. Yeah, exactly. I did it myself. You know, I've got a a big brother who's a little farther along in retirement. He did his own too, so he kind of compared notes on that. But you're right. Social Security is a perfect example of where you know why did I do this? There's plenty of calculators doing different things out there, but they don't seem to really address retirement withdrawals very well. And, and Social Security is a perfect example because I think a lot of us. As we're getting closer, we're thinking, well, wasn't Social Security itself a tax? So what, you're, you're taxing the tax on the tax? You know, right. it's not intuitive that we're all going to get taxed on Social Security. Uh, and then you you realize, yeah, you can be and you probably will be if you've got any significant other sources of taxable income in retirement. So it, it, it addresses that. It's one of the only things in the federal tax system that doesn't get adjusted for inflation. Too. You've got these numbers that you get to certain inflection points is I'm sure yeah, I know you've talked about in some other of your podcasts where you 50% of the money will get taxed or some part of 50% of it will get taxed. Then you get up to 85% of your social security can get taxed. Well, those inflection points, for, you know, regardless of your tax, whether you're married filing jointly or single or what, they don't change every year like all the other brackets. So they're going to hit more and more of us, you know, every year. Yeah, you, you've, of course, you accounted for that because it's it's complex. Uh, how, how can somebody find that? Is that uh, something online that you have right now? Yeah. Yes, it's at retirementtaxsaver.com. And it's also mentioned in the book, From Savvy Saver to Smart Spender. That's at Amazon. If you just put in the words from savvy, that'll narrow it down pretty close to. So you can, you can track that website down both ways. Yeah, and we'll put that in the show notes. I, I think just any in information you can have to figure out how to do better with your own retirement planning, uh, especially on taxes, because that's one of the biggest things that you can uh, control. And we'll we'll put a link to the the book as well. I'll, I'll say right now uh, that we love education, we love reading, and the first three people that email me, podcast at kylefp.com, I'll send out a book. Uh, I'll send you Dan's book, From Savvy Saver to Smart Spender, How to Pick a Tax-Wise Retirement Withdrawal Strategy. So first three, you get your dibs. So you get to send it on out. Uh, Dan's book to you, but uh, we'll have links to for everyone else uh, as well too. So, so have fun with that, guys. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, now, just even the, the title, From Savvy Saver to Smart Spender, uh, besides the alliteration, you must have had a good uh, publisher or editor to give you some good alliteration there. Uh, that might have been yours. But um, I, Saver to Spender, how does that feel to go from being someone that saves all the time to start taking money out from your accounts? It's, it's hard. It's hard to do. You know, you, you, you've thought of this thing as this lockbox, you know, do not touch, you know, unless there's an emergency for your whole working life. And all of a sudden, you know, you're just supposed to start pulling the stuff out of there. And it's, it's, it's not an easy thing. I think for, for people that have managed to save, I think they have that discipline. I mean, you're going to have to unlearn a habit that you uh, hone for decades. So, yeah, I mean, you, you think it would be easy, uh, you know, hey, you, know, you, you earned it, you deserve it. I mean, you, there's, there's one little guy on your shoulder telling you that, but there's the other one saying, hey, that's the box you're not supposed to use. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's interesting. I've got uh, um, at least one client, I'm thinking of one in particular, but I'm sure I have several others, where there's such savers, and this is a good thing, this is how you got there, this is how you got this opportunity. Uh, they just can't stop saving. And so we have one account where we send out uh, several thousand dollars a month to them because that is what they need out of their investments for retirement. We have another account where they put $100 a month back into that account. <laughs> we're, we're basically sending them, let's just go with round numbers. We're basically sending them a thousand bucks a month and they're sending us $100 a month uh, to the, basically the same exact account because they just have to uh, be savers. You know, it, it, life would be easier, I guess, if we just sent them nine hundred dollars, and it, it would accomplish the same thing. You, but you it doesn't. So. And you know what? If that's what it takes to to feel comfortable taking money out from your accounts that you save for, to know that you are still taking from your income and putting away for a rainy day, that's not a bad thing. I mean, that's uh, it. It sounds kind of funny, uh, but it's also what you need to do to kind of. Uh, keep scratching that itch Well, you spent 40 years being a savvy saver. Uh, and I think uh, sometimes it, it's such a, a huge shift to become that smart spender. Um, it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot to just change that in your mind. And it, it's just a really quick, like you, you probably became a saver over time, but all of a sudden, boom, you kind of become a spender like overnight. And so exactly. any way that you can maybe prepare ahead of time to become that spender or or if that's what you need to do to have just like a little bit of the saver going on that's that's okay nothing uh nothing wrong with that uh, but i think what's interesting with people that are sp savers and i like how you use the word savvy in there it's it's not only about saving for the future it's also just getting the most out of what you have like stretching your dollar and what you're doing right here is talking about how do you stretch your dollar? Like you have money that's saved up, somehow it's gonna show up on your tax return at some point in your life. And having a tax wise retirement withdrawal strategy is a way to stretch your dollar. And I think that's uh, appealing to the, the people that have saved so well to say, okay, yes, you had to go from saver to spender, but let's try to still stretch the dollars that we have by being, being tax wise. Exactly. You know, you, you, you have done some things if you are a savvy saver to learn about markets and where to put your money and, you know, risk and return and all that stuff. So put some effort into being strategic and thoughtful about how you take it out. I mean, you're, you're at the one yard line. You just did a 99 yard kickoff return. Don't fumble the ball on the one before you walk into the end zone, you know, retirement here, you know, make sure you're thoughtful all the way through. Yeah. And you, you want to be tax wise and one part of wisdom is uh, kind of learning from others. And there's a lot of ways that people can plan out, but there's one way in particular uh, called conventional wisdom. It's saying, here's the different types of accounts. Here's the way you probably should go about it. Tell me about conventional wisdom. And I've got a feeling uh, there's not as much wisdom in it as, uh, as it sounds like, according to you. Well, your, your hunch is pretty good, Jeremy. What I found was most websites talked about this, and I actually even came across somebody that had done a survey that was very consistent with this, that uh, retired, required minimum distributions, they kick in, you know, it's, it was 70 and a half, and it was 72, you now it's 73, it's going to be 75. So it's kind of a moving target. So let's say your RMD age, when you have to start taking that money out, otherwise you get a pretty big penalty. 
out of those 401k and IRAs. The conventional wisdom is leave that money alone as long as you can, and then only take out the minimum that you have to. So if you are, if your RMD age is, for example, 72, you, you, you don't dip into it when you're 65 or 69 or 70 or 71, you wait until the, the last year. And then when you have to take it out, then you take out the amount that the IRS tells you is the minimum. And, you know, I, I understand at a base level, they don't really explain necessarily why in great detail, but I think the, the reasoning there is, well, that's tax deferred growth and that's a great thing. And, and at some level it is, but uh, yes, as I peeled the onion back, I realized there's a lot more to the story. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, a lot of people I talk to, they say taxes are going up in the future. Okay, so in the future, taxes go up is their belief. And then we ask, what do you want to do? What do you want your money to do? Well, I want it to grow. So when you have tax deferred accounts, that means you will pay the taxes in the future. And you're telling me that taxes will be bigger in the future. And you're telling me you want and you're expecting your accounts to be greater in the future. So you're, you're basically saying, I am expecting to pay more taxes in the future. And so I'm going to make sure that it actually happens. Uh, that's what's <laughs> happening when you're waiting till RMD age. If you have that belief that your investments will grow, if you have that belief that taxes are going up, and most people I talk to have both of those those beliefs. Right. So you mentioned in the book one simple change to your strategy that could save you thousands of dollars in federal income taxes over your retirement years. I, I think you maybe um, kind of undershot it a little bit. We do some tax planning, and we'll actually project out like your entire retirement's worth of tax returns, and it's amazing how when you make use of a different withdrawal strategy your your lifetime tax bill could drop by 20 percent if not more uh, and of course that doesn't happen for everybody everything's very particular but we see a lot of times the projections being tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars uh lower uh just by having a different withdrawal strategy than conventional wisdom so what's what's your change for uh for saving tax dollars i, I got a feeling we're on the same track all right. Don't don't wait to withdraw. Start yeah. taking the money out before. I mean, after, obviously, you want to wait until you don't have to pay an early withdrawal penalty. But most of us aren't retiring at 59 and a half anyway. So once you get past that magic age, start taking some of that money out in your lower tax bracket years. You know, you, there's kind of like a U curve uh, as you get close to that RMD age where you the high upper left part of the U is that last couple of years of making lots of money when you're working full time. And in a high tax bracket, then you stop that, your tax bracket kind of dives down for a few years if you don't start taking money out of the uh, 401k, but then it's going to jump back up again once those RMDs kick in. So you've got the bottom of the U are those low tax years in your 60s and early 70s. Well, use them and don't lose them when you, you're in those lower tax brackets. Maybe you're in a 12% bracket or something like that in those pre-RMD years, you're going to jump up to 22 or 24% once you start taking out RMDs, well, take advantage of uh, that lower tax rate in those pre-RMD years. And, and uh, you know, every one of those years, you can take some money out and not break the bank uh, in terms of the uh, extra taxes you owe up front and really wind up saving a lot of money in the long term. Well, yeah, I think uh, when it comes to tax planning, the number one rule is to pay taxes when they are low. And <laughs> you're just describing there how oftentimes you can find when your taxes are likely to be low. And of course, uh, your situation can change, the tax loss has always changed. But generally speaking, when there's two people, the taxes are lower than when there's one because the tax brackets for a married couple are double the size of single. And if you walk into retirement being married, later on, somebody's likely to die first and that surviving spouse will show up as the single individual and likely at a higher tax bracket. And we'll probably talk a little bit about Social Security. But the way Social Security gets taxed is so funky that it can almost go to a uh, like a low tax or a higher than you expect tax. And so if you can take money out before you hit Social Security, before you're taking Social Security, that might be the bottom of that U-curve you're talking about. Uh, and then, of course, required minimums uh, hit later on. There's all these things that hit later on that are probably pushing up your, your taxes. And one thing on uh, RMDs, required minimums, I want to talk about is it, it's interesting how, especially, you know, we're in America, Americans don't like being told what to do, except for RMDs. It seems like people will uh, tell me all the time that they 
uh, kind of are independent. They'll do what they want. They've got things figured out. And because of that, they're going to wait until RMDH, which is just seems a bit kind of ironic in a way. You know, RMD required, like you're forced to do this. Most people, most Americans don't want to do what they're forced to do, right? If, and you have this, you point out very accurately that especially once you reach 59 and a half, yeah, even 55 for some places like 401ks, when you retire after the age of, of 55 from that, that place, you have many years where you are not required to, but you could. And usually taking money out when you could, but you're not required to, makes the most sense because you, you took it out after doing some level of analysis, like using your tool, and realize this is a better uh, situation. The other part, M, is minimum. You could always do more than the minimum. A lot of people feel like this is all I can do. And of course, D is distribution. It has to come out of the account, usually like to you. And a lot of times you've been waiting and waiting and waiting to take out the money. You don't actually need it by the time you get there. So it's just being distributed to you. And if you loved the tax deferral, that's why you didn't take the money out, guess what it's doing? It's just sitting now in some sort of taxable account. It's doing the thing now that you didn't want it to do. And so any way you can take the money out before you're required uh, to do more than the minimum and not distribute it into your taxable bank or brokerage account to keep that tax deferral going is the way to go. And of course, my belief is a Roth conversion is usually the best way to do that because you can choose how much you do with the Roth conversion, especially if you're below required minimum distribution age, above 59 and a half, you can do whatever the right amount is for you. And it's not distributed to that taxable account you don't like, it's moved over, converted to that uh, Roth IRA where you're doing the, uh, you keep going with the tax deferral. It's, it's kind of keeps going with what you, you want it to do. Yeah, and if right now, you know, we have a market that's down depending on what index you look at over the last year, maybe what, 15 or 20%. And, you know, take that that $1,000 that's now worth $800 and convert it now into a Roth, and then we'll get back up to 1,000 and all that appreciation is not gonna be taxed ever again. You know, there, there is, there's a number of uh, reasons why now is a great time to be implementing these strategies. That That's one of them. Yeah, you got it. And I, I like how you point out too, you can implement this change without any new investment. This isn't buying anything special at all. It's just using your existing accounts. How, how would somebody go about doing that? Well, it's pretty easy. I mean, you, you maybe you have a, an account at Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, any of the big guys or the medium-sized guys. Almost all of them have a pretty comparable selection of whether you want to invest your own stocks or mutual funds, a wide variety. You can invest in the exact same same ones, more or less, you know, an index fund if you like S&P 500. Take, you know, go ahead and sell that regular IRA, $10,000 worth. Yeah, most of the places, they'll let you set up the Roth and the regular IRA at the same time place that fidelity or whatever and you can just hit a couple of buttons and transfer the money online you know if you want to call somebody up just to make sure you got it right the first time great but you can pretty much do most of this stuff online and just you know exactly what you sold and if you want to keep it simple or you like your investments when it goes into the new bucket the Roth IRA bucket go ahead and put in those same mutual funds you sold on the other one there's not, there's not going to be any wash sale rules or anything you have to worry about when you're doing a conversion yeah, we hear that sometimes where people say, well, this is all well and good. I believe you, but uh, I, wh which one makes better interest? You know, which one grows different? And of course, traditional accounts, Roth accounts, they're just names for how the government wants to tax you or set up the rules to tax you. You can buy the exact same type of investments in your Roth as you can in traditional. So there's uh, zero accounting for, well, I'll make more money in the Roth or I'll make more money in the traditional. Uh, if they're not the same investments, they could be. And so that's not uh, a consideration at all. But what is a consideration, you point that out, is Social Security, and especially how you can kind of combine your, your tax deferred, like traditional accounts, your non-IRA accounts, your savings accounts, your Social Security benefits. How you can kind of combine all these together to, to take into account that, that strategy. Uh, let me just talk about or ask you about Social Security uh, real quick. How do you think people should go approach making their social security decision? Well, um, I, I think what's interesting about it, one of the interesting things is that uh, you don't have to have a lot of money in those tax deferred accounts for that to be a, have a big impact when you start withdrawing on your social security. As somebody with 
you know, three or four or five hundred thousand dollars in those accounts, once they start withdrawing out of those in a few years, that could very well start triggering those social security taxes. So I think for those folks in particular, they should be very conscious of, you know, hey, can I take that money out now at a 10 percent or 12 percent? And go right up to, you know, if the, the numbers kind of work pretty well. I, I'm interested if you found this as well, Jeremy, that if you, you're you in a certain tax bracket, and if, let's say it's October, you know what you're going to make anyway. And I'm in the 12% bracket. But if I if I actually made another $20,000 this year, then I'm going to make, I'd still be in the 12% bracket. Well, it's almost like a no-brainer to take that $20,000 then out of that taxable account. You know, max out what you can do in that 12% bracket this year because, pretty good chance that money's never going to see 12% again. And it's going to come out later at a higher rate. How does that work for you? Yeah, we, we see that uh, all the time. What's interesting, and this is why uh, you've got to have a calculator. You've got to do the math. And really what you're looking for is something called the marginal rate. Uh, just because you're in a certain tax bracket uh, doesn't mean the next decision you make uh, is within that tax bracket. So the kind of two examples I like to use is, is just asking what's the name for what's the other name for the top of the 12 percent bracket well it's, it's the bottom of the 22 percent bracket so you might be somebody that worked your whole life or you're in retirement and you say i'm a 12 percent bracket uh, kind of person well it's not like the government gave you a card saying you're always in the 12 percent bracket it's just that your income has always added up to be within the 12 percent bracket and it just might be you're at the top of the 12 percent bracket so sometimes people uh know they're in a certain bracket, but then feel like their next decision is always in that bracket. You mm. you might make the next $10,000 piece of income and it'll be in the 22% bracket because you, you hopped over to the next one. So that's just something to keep in mind. It's always your marginal rate. Right. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that when the social security comes into play, uh, it's kind of like a multiplier effect where sometimes, especially when you hit require minimum distribution, and I'm sure this is one of the reasons why you advocate uh, doing these distributions or conversions kind of early because you're avoiding the time you hit RMDs and you're avoiding the time that you're fully and maxing out Social Security. You don't have to worry about a couple of these things if you do things, uh, do this early. Uh, but the way that it works with Social Security is sometimes it's almost like this multiplier where if I take $1,000 out of my IRA, $850 perhaps of Social Security went from tax-free to taxable. So yeah. you're not paying taxes on the thousand dollars. Your income went up by eighteen fifty, and we've got uh, plenty of podcasts. We'll we'll link to our Social Security archives about that. But what's funny about it is one point eight five times twelve percent is twenty two point two percent. So uh, I don't think this was intentional by the government. I'm I'm convinced it's not intentional. But a lot of people will love the Roth conversion concept. And they'll say, I will want to do it, but I only want to do it to the top of the 12% bracket. Mm -hmm. Well, they're on Social Security. When they look at their marginal rate, even though they're in the 12% bracket, their cost is 22%. And so my thought is if you like it for a little, you should like it for a lot. And it just might be that you could do a thirty or 40000 conversion within the 12% bracket, except because you're on Social Security, you're paying 22%. And if that's you, which is so many people we see day in and day out, and you were A-OK -okay doing the conversion at a 22% cost, because that's how it worked out with your Social Security and conversion combo, well, then just keep on going into the 22% bracket. Sure. Uh, because if you liked it for a little at 22% cost, you'll like it for a lot at 22% cost. Because the math is probably the same, where uh, you felt it was a good idea to do this conversion at that certain cost, well, you've got more room and it's it's a very nice convenience right now at this point in the tax code that when you're on social security and you're in that 85 percent of social security's taxable situation it's kind of just like a really smooth transition there's no uh no difference you it, actually it saves you it saves you 0 0.2 right you <laughs> you were at 22.2 and then sometimes you you drop down to 22.0 uh, so you may as well keep it going so that's that's something that until you see the math on it until you kind of try out a few different things and plug in, what if I do this? What if I do that? Uh, you don't know. You don't know that's uh, that's there, but uh, right. a lot of times it is. You know, the other thing with the calculator, you can look at, well, what if I start Social Security at 67 versus 70 and things like that? I, I'm kind of one that's leaning towards waiting to use it because I look at it as old age insurance. You know, I don't really know when I'm going to get hit by the bus. So I'd rather kind of max out that Social Security 
And if if I die early, I guess the system won. But you know, running out of money is the least of my worries if I get hit by a bus next week, right? So I'm I'm playing the long game there. But it, how do you make it to 70 without withdrawing from Social Security? Well, you can use your IRA and 401k that was going to be in that lockbox. Well, now it can be that bridge money that you can use for your expenses to get you to 70 and take advantage between 60 and 70. If you wait those three years, your Social Security check even regardless of inflation, it's going to be 24% higher every year for the rest of your life, which is hopefully a long and rewarding one. Yeah, I love how you call it old age insurance because that's the name of it, old age survivor and disability insurance. And if you're trying to make a Social Security decision, the best way to approach it is to look at it for what it is. It's there to help you out in your old age. And if you happen to get to old age, you probably want more Social Security than less. Uh, and it's for survivors, right? If there's two of you, figuring out the way to max out what shows up to the survivor is a huge thing. If there's two of you, at least one of your Social Securities is going away. And so figuring out how to take that higher one to make it a higher amount for the survivor is a huge thing. And of course, it's insurance. It's there, like you said, what if you uh, live to an old age? What if you don't? It's insurance. Uh, when you buy any level of insurance, you want the cheapest insurance that covers the most amount. And there's no commissions with Social Security. Like you're not paying a commission to anybody. There's no uh, reserve fund, uh, unfortunately, I guess, for uh, Social Security <laughs> the way it is. Like there's no profit. You don't have to create any profit to uh, the insurance company uh, when you're uh, buying Social Security, I guess, in a way. So there's all these expenses that are uh, ripped out of the insurance side of Social Security that you would have if you bought a pension annuity kind of a account from a from a private insurance company. There would be commissions. There would be uh, kind of extra money set aside to surplus and uh, profits and things like that. And so because of that, when you approach Social Security as old age survivor insurance, when you're um, looking at retirement, having that mindset is what will most likely lend you towards towards the best outcome for your social security decision. Yeah, and then if you wait until 70, like you're suggesting, you can take that money out of the IRA or 401k, 401k and not worry about it triggering those kind of those surtaxes on your social security and because you don't because you don't have it yet. Yeah, so that, that's right. kind of a, a double whammy in a good way. Exactly. Uh, what when you look at how you withdraw money from your accounts, and what you do with boosting up Social Security, uh, it's kind of like a one plus one equals three kind of situation. You know, if you just ran, what's the value of withdrawing your money in a certain way? You can see here's the value of that. And if you just ran, what's the value of me waiting on Social Security? You can see what's the value of that. But when you combine it together, waiting on Social Security gives you more time to do this tax-wise withdrawal strategy. It most often, gives you a, like more than a double whammy, it's a triple whammy because it gives, gives you, it like the, their powers combined are more than than individually there. Good. Right. Well, it's been fun talking with you, Dan. I've got one more question. Before we do that, tell us what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Well, um, I think you can go to the website, retirementtaxsaver.com is a great way. I'm on um, LinkedIn as well at that location. Uh, those are probably the best ways to get a hold of me. You got it. We'll have links to that. We'll have links to the books. And of course, uh, if you'd like uh, like a copy of Dan's book and you're one of the first three people to email us at podcast at kylefp.com, uh, we'll send you out the book or go to our uh, website, retirement-reveal.com. There's a contact us form there to ask for a copy of the book or send us any questions. All right, Dan, we've got one final question for you. Tell us something about yourself that few people know about. And remember, this podcast is rated clean. All right, I'll be mindful of that. Well, I, I've been a patent attorney for 37 years, and I actually have uh, a couple of my own patents. I came up with something actually when I was making root beer floats for the kids. It, with the excess foam problem, you put the ice cream in and pour the root beer in, and I came up with a, a strainer that fits into your glass where you can put ice in it, then pour the root beer in first, get it all cooled down and fizzed out. Then I pull out the strainer and ice and then add the ice cream and voila, you don't have excess foam. You get just enough foam. <laughs> uh, so the, I got a patent on the system and, and a design patent on the strainer. That's amazing. The, the kicker is that actually, I don't use it for root beer floats often at all, but it's great for chilling red wine. Ah, interesting. That's great. 
Now, now is that um, is this product available on Amazon too, or? You know, it, it's kind of run its course out there. I've got a few in the garage. If somebody wants to contact me, we can maybe work something out. There you go. Oh, that was uh, I was not expecting that, but I love it. Thank you, Dan. Good. Great. Well, thanks for talking uh, root beers with us. Thanks for talking tax wise retirement uh, strategies. You you save money on taxes. You can have a lot more uh, money for uh, for root beer floats. I think. There you go. All right. Thanks, thank Dan. And thank you for listening to the Retirement Reveal podcast. We believe if you know more about your money, you will feel better about your money and you will make better money decisions.